Hello again, everybody, and we're now into the double digits, Drydock episode number 11. So, what are we going to talk about this week? Well, the ever-growing list of questions means we're not going to run out of things to talk about, but let's start with that 5k subscriber competition. Now, for the competition, I asked you to identify the ship in this picture. And uh, a lot of you gave it a very good go, and I'm surprised, actually, genuinely surprised, by how many of you were actually either right on the money or very, very close to the money. So, let's go through it, and uh, for the benefit of everybody, because I know a few of you, when you emailed, said please give feedback as to your thoughts and working processes, let's go through how we identify what this ship is from scratch. So the first clue you can see here is the furled Union Jack at the prow of the ship. This means that the ship is a vessel of the British Royal Navy. Well, that helps cut it down a little bit. The next clue are these two single firing guns on the prow of the ship. Now this rounds it down even further because it means the ship is definitely not a Leander class or later as those ships had twin and triple guns when you got up to the town class. So we're looking at 1920s and earlier. Now the Arethusa class and all light cruiser classes of the Royal Navy before it only had a single gun on the front, which means that this ship must be one of either the C class, D class or E class light cruisers, or possibly a Hawkins class heavy cruiser. Now, these two details allow us to immediately rule out the Hawkins class, and that's because the Hawkins class heavy cruisers had their funnels right up against the superstructure, so that rightmost circle means it's not one of those. And additionally, on the left you see there is a single gun pointing at the rear of the second funnel, whereas on the Hawkins class the amidship 7.5 inch guns were either side of the funnel. So it's definitely not a Hawkins class heavy cruiser. So we're on to light cruisers now, we're down to three classes. Now, using these same details, we can also rule out the E class, that or the Emerald class, because on that class, it's the second funnel that's actually the larger of the two. So those funnels are the wrong way around for an Emerald class. And also, as with the Hawkins class, on the Emerald class, the amidships guns are a pair of guns either side in roughly the position of that uh, left handmost circle. So it's not an Emerald class either. So we're down to a D class or a C class. Now still using this we can actually rule out the D class and that's because although that left hand gun in the uh, behind the second funnel is in the correct position for either a C or a D class, on the D class there's also a gun between the first funnel and the superstructure and as you can see on the right hand side there, there isn't a gun turret there, and moreover there isn't room for there to be one. So that actually rules out the D class as well. So that leaves us with the C class cruisers. Now the C class was built in a number of subclasses, so which subclass are we looking at? Well again we return to those forward guns. Most of the C class subclasses were built with a single gun forward. There were only two subclasses that were built with the twin guns forward. And that, of course, is the Ceres class and the Carlisle class. So how do we distinguish between the two? Well, for this, you have to look back at the bow. You see, the Carlisle class were built to rectify a problem that the Ceres class had of shipping too much water over the front, so their bows were built up quite substantially. If you go and have a look at a picture of a Carlisle class, you'll see that, roughly speaking, the tip of the bow comes up to about the same height as the barrel of the forward 6-inch gun. And as you can see here, that is not happening on this ship. So that means the ship is not a Carlisle class, which means by a process of elimination, it must be a series class. Further clues that point to a C class include, but are not limited to, the position of the three inch guns here, uh, either side of the first funnel. And this sneaky little thing, which when you zoom in, is actually the reflection off of one of the twin torpedo tubes. And this is actually one of the strongest clues not related to the guns because the C-Class had four twin tubes uh, in offset positions and this next on the starboard side next to the midship's gun is in exactly the right place for a C-Class cruiser. 
whereas on a D-Class you would expect to see a triple launcher just forward of the first funnel, where in this particular photo there is the smaller of the two lifeboats. On an E-Class, the torpedo launchers are a pair of quad launchers on each side and they would be much further back out of scope of this picture. Now, a few of you went even above and beyond the call of duty in working out the time and location of uh, this photo. So, the fact that it's taken on a glass plate and has the manner of dress suggests a photograph taken in the 1920s. And some very eagle-eyed people noticed that building with the two clock towers uh, just above and to the left of the Union Jack as the Liver building in Liverpool. And once you correct for the point of view, that means that this photo has almost certainly been taken from the southern side of the Camel Laird Basin in Birkenhead in the UK. So we have a fairly narrow time period. We have an exact location. Um, all that remains to work out is the exact ship and the, hopefully the exact time that the photo was taken. Now, as far as that goes, I have my own conclusions, but since I'm putting this out publicly and I want to be absolutely 100% sure, I have submitted the photo to the Wirral archives and they're going to have a look at it over the next week or so and hopefully get back to me. And uh, don't worry, I've written down what my conclusion is for exact ship name and time, and we'll see if it matches up with theirs. So that is the process of identification for the 5k subscriber competition. Now, as far as winners go, um, just checking the sheet here, there were a just over 60 entries of which 36 um, got it right as far as saying either it was a C-class or it was a series subclass. Um, unfortunately, I had to exclude the ones that said Carlisle um, purely because of that uh, bow clue there. Although, just to be clear, if someone said it could be Carlisle or series, uh, I've let that go through. It's just only when someone said definitively, no, this is a Carlisle class. Um, anyway, so in terms of the winners, uh, I've decided there will be three. Um, I'm going to go with the first person who got it right, uh, the person who gave the most uh, interesting extreme fact-finding detail, and of course the good old random number generator. So those three people will be contacted over the course of the next coming week, and assuming that they are happy to be identified at least by a YouTube nickname, um, I will tell you who they are next week, along with what the prizes are. So that's the 5k competition uh, closed for entries. Thank you very much and I'm very impressed by the amount of detail that you all went to. So with that, on to the questions and uh, Rapper Flow asks, if I'm right, the Japanese fleet was planning to aim for a gigantic one day long all out gun battle and night action with their entire fleet. If this actually happened, how would you think the IGN would have performed against the USN without Pearl Harbor? So this obviously assumes that the Americans would sail over to the western side of the Pacific, um, which we've kind of covered a little bit before. Uh, someone asked the question about what happens if they hit the aircraft carriers and not the battleships. Now... If we are talking about reality, obviously, if the Americans were for some reason stupid enough to send their battle fleet in um, to the Western Pacific in early 1942, then you're talking about the entire Japanese Navy and air wing showing up, and it's basically going to be an air battle. Um, and that's not, I think, a battle that the Americans are going to come out of very well. However, if we're looking at the battle in the way that the Japanese were planning for it to be fought right up before they clued into the fact that aircraft carriers were actually really powerful, well, the Japanese plan was for their fleet to engage under the cover of night with cruisers and destroyers and use their torpedoes to damage or destroy as many American ships as possible because effectively when you look at the lineup there isn't any way for the Japanese just to win a massive stand-up gun battle um, they've actually at an even more of a disadvantage against the American Navy uh, 
compared to the high seas fleet versus the grand fleet at Jutland. The Japanese have the four Congos, they have two Fusos, two Iseis, and two Nagatos, and in theory, by the time the American fleet actually gets across the Pacific, they might just about be able to scrape Yamato in as well. Now, on that basis, the Japanese fleet does have a slight speed advantage, but they're looking to actually fight the Americans. And in a straight-up gunline battle, they're in trouble. Um, they're in a lot of trouble. I mean, they've got two 16-inch gunships. The Americans have the Colorados, the North Carolinas, and maybe even some of the South Dakotas. Um, and the they've got four 14-inch gunships. The Americans have pretty much all the standards that aren't Colorados. And... Uh, then you've got the four Congos armed with 14-inch guns, and the Americans have things like, uh, well, the older standards and uh, Arkansas, New York, that kind of stuff to deal with them. Yamato is basically the only outside context problem that the American fleet probably can't deal with immediately, but the numbers and quality available to the American fleet compared to the Japanese fleet in terms of pure gunpower mean that there'll probably be more than enough ships to occupy the Yamato and grind it down just through pure attrition. Which the Japanese knew, and is basically why they planned for this sort of attritional warfare using destroyers and cruisers. So, again, sort of looping back around to your question again, if everything went the Japanese way, well, maybe not even that, but let's say that it, the American fleet sails, and let's assume for a minute that the aircraft carriers on one side or the other kind of cancel each other out and don't just wipe wipe each other out uh, or wipe out the other fleet. Um, you're looking, given the performance of the American fleet in 1942, the Japanese probably would have been more correct than not, assuming they could actually find the American fleet as it came across. Uh, the Americans had some very nasty surprises with the capability of Japanese night fighting and torpedo capability at a time when their own torpedoes really weren't working at all and they didn't have a widespread use of radar and the radar they did have definitely wasn't gunnery radar. Uh, so, yeah, overall, the, the Japanese probably have maybe a 60-70% chance of pulling off their torpedo attrition plan. Whether or not they would have actually taken out enough American capital ships to make a, make enough of a difference to the gun line at the end of the day is another matter entirely. So I would give the Japanese plan maybe a 50-50 chance of success, again assuming those two caveats of the carrier forces basically cancelling each other out and the Americans being dumb enough to actually sail across the, Atlant uh, the Pacific sorry, and engage them head-on right after Pearl Harbor, which... The Americans weren't. There's a lot of alternate history questions, so there's probably another alternate history special in the works in the next couple of weeks, but don't worry, we'll have a few other specials before then. Um, John58476 asks, I'd like to know what you think of railguns and shipborne lasers uh, for future ship ideas. Well, we've kind of already covered railguns before, so basic summary of that. They could be useful. Um, they need to avoid the idea of winding up with guided shells that cost as much as missiles because at that point you might as well just use a missile um, and they really need to solve the power generation issues on ships either they need to vastly uprate the amount of power that the ships can generate or they need to massively improve the efficiency of rail guns uh, room temperature superconductor would do it but to be honest a room temperature superconductor would probably change the face of civilization and naval warfare so far that a rail gun would probably be the least of your worries at that point Shipborne lasers, on the other hand, well, they are a little bit more fragile than rail guns, and they do have similar power consumption issues. However, I do think it's far more likely that we will see lasers on ships as sort of par for the course weaponry much sooner than rail guns. Now, of course, there are already laser weapons on ships at sea already. Um, there's uh, laser jammers, laser rangefinders, and although it's technically illegal, it's pretty much an open secret that the more advanced navies have laser dazzlers as well. But there have been a number of successful tests, albeit with very large, very power-hungry lasers, showing that 
they can work as defensive weapons for taking out incoming missiles um, and in theory possibly even larger shells and other projectiles and that would be incredibly useful because the single biggest threat to a ship at the moment are high-speed anti-shipping missiles well as to torpedoes as well but you can't really do anything to a torpedo with a surface-based weapon but a hypersonic anti-shipping missile leaves very little time for a ship to engage with its own surface-to-air missiles and they move far too quickly both for close-in weapon systems to track properly or engage given their range limitations. Uh, basically if you have a hypersonic missile coming in if your CIWS system is actually engaging it even if you actually manage to score a direct hit unless you actually detonate it the it's probably going to hit you anyway. It's just a choice of do you want to be hit by several tons of flaming wreckage that then explodes, or do you want to be hit by a coherent missile? It's not really the world's best choice. Now, whereas a laser obviously is a speed of light weapon, so tracking issues are a lot less significant. And with the fact that obviously it's a line of sight weapon, you can use it at the same kind of ranges that you can use sort of your medium range surface to air missiles. So I would anticipate that further developments on lasers are probably going to be the first thing to come out and they will probably come out to replace close in weapon systems, things like CIWS, Goalkeeper, uh, C RAM, things like that. Curtis Boyer asks, what unit of measure does calibre refer to in terms of naval gun length like 16 inch 50 calibre? I only know of the use of calibre in reference to an inch for bore diameter like a 50 cap 0.5 calibre uh, rifle. So you're actually right, the calibre refers to the width of the bore on a gun. So 16 inch gun it has a 16 inch calibre. Now, why people use the term for length of the gun, it's basically a multiple of the gun's bore diameter. So a 16-inch 50 caliber gun is 16 inches wide at the bore, but the gun itself is 16 multiplied by 50 inches long. Now, the reason that this is such a useful term of reference is it tells you pretty much immediately upon reading roughly what the capabilities of that gun are going to be relative to other guns of a similar size. So take for example say a 5 inch 50 caliber gun is going to be just over half the length of a 16 inch 30 caliber gun and so therefore you might be thinking oh well then the the 16 inch gun is almost tw twice as long it's going to shoot further it's going to be a big nasty weapon and yes it's a 16 inch gun so it's it's not to be sniffed at but the 5 inch 50 caliber is actually going to be a higher velocity weapon and almost certainly probably going to actually outrange the 16 inch 30 and that's because the using the caliber it means it, it calibrates the proportional length of the gun to the bore diameter and so this can kind of inform you of how long the barrel is relative to the projectile it itself is shooting and what what that amounts to effectively is that the, the longer the barrel, generally as long as your propellant is okay, the higher velocity the shell because the shell has more space tra to travel in that is confined and therefore the propellant has longer to accelerate the projectile. Now obviously this assumes uh, relatively modern slower burning uh, charge powders. So this is why, for example, the 16-inch 50 guns of the USS Iowa are significantly superior to the 16-inch 45 caliber guns of, say, the USS North Carolina. Because when the guns have been built on similar principles, that extra five calibers means you're talking well over 50 inches of extra barrel length, which means those shells are going to be flying faster and therefore they're going to be going further and hitting harder. And so then when you look at other guns, if you see, oh, this gun is a 50 caliber or a 55 caliber, or even in some cases a 60 caliber, you know it's a high velocity gun. Whereas if you see something like a 38 or 40 caliber, you know it's going to be a fairly low velocity gun and something in the mid 40, somewhere where between sort of 42 and 47 caliber is kind of the standard uh, for guns, or at least when it comes to naval artillery.
Brendan Purvis asks, uh, what about the disaster that was the British K-class submarines? In what way was this reflective of the thinking of the British Navy and what was the direct consequence of the K-class on the British Navy at the time? So the K-class were symptomatic of something that pretty much all the major navies were trying to do it towards the end of World War I and shortly thereafter, which was trying to make submarines a weapon that could operate with the fleet. Everyone had recognised that submarines had some significant limitations when it came to taking on actual warships, primarily centred around the fact that on the surface they were so slow that pre-dreadnoughts could outrun them, and underwater they were so slow that they could be pushed backwards by particularly strong currents. So given that the average battle fleet of the time could shift at 20 plus knots, submarines were a lot of money to invest in, and they really couldn't offer all that much in terms of contributing to a big fleet battle like Jutland. Now, we actually saw this in Jutland itself, where the Germans tried to deploy uh, U-boats to intercept the Grand Fleet as it came out, but as it turned out, if the Grand Fleet just motors on past, if unless you're in exactly the right position with the submarine capabilities of the time, you just are not fast enough to relocate in time. And so everyone was trying to make bigger, faster, more heavily armed submarines, and the K-Class was the British attempt. So to address the speed issue, they stuck a steam turbine in, and they turned out a submarine that could make 24 knots on the surface. So it was a submarine that could genuinely keep up with the fleet. Um, it was obviously very big to accommodate this, so it had a fairly big torpedo armament. So on paper, it all looked really good. Now, they were pretty useless for anything other than their intended role because with the steam power plant it meant they had lots and lots of holes and they needed to douse the flames and seal all those holes before diving because otherwise they'd let all the water in and then just go straight to the bottom. Um, so for normal submarine operations where you need the ability to crash dive they definitely were not a thing that could be practically used. And as well as this, they were fairly big, fairly ungainly, and required a number of structural alterations fairly quickly um, just to stop them randomly diving off without warning. As a result of this, they were involved in quite a number of accidents, both uh, diving beyond their crush depths, ramming each other, being rammed, ramming other things, and uh, wildly careening out of control. Now, with all that said, for about maybe two to five years, in a very limited context, they actually did, in theory, at least present a relatively effective weapon. And this was because their speed meant they could keep up with the fleet, as we've said, um, but their slowness to dive was less of an issue in fleet operations because with any kind of half-decent scouting force, the main fleet would get plenty of warning that the enemy was uh, coming in, so the K-class would, in theory, have plenty of time to dive. Now, the reason why I say very limited situations is because, obviously, once they go underwater, they lose that advantage they have of being able to keep up with the fleet. Their underwater speed is a lot less, which effectively ties them to a very small radius, and if the enemy fleet makes a course change, or the scouts got the course slightly wrong, or the battle just lasts more than a few hours, it means that the centre point of combat is just going to wander away from them, and there's nothing they can do to catch up. Because if they surface, they're just going to get torn apart. But in the very limited contexts of taking on the high seas fleet in the second part of the First World War, the high seas fleet, because of British in signals intelligence, could be relatively reasonably tied down to a certain small battle area, and so it was possible that the K-class accompanying the fleet, when the high seas fleet was sighted, assuming that they were told where they were correctly, and or the Admiral, say like Jellicoe, made a really good call, they could then have submerged, set out a picket line, and be relatively close to the action uh, in such a manner that they could get in a decent set of torpedo salvos, which could potentially tip the balance of any fleet action. Unfortunately, as soon as the World War I was over and the threat of the high seas fleet was removed, 
this caveat no longer applied to more general situations because if the British were going to face off against the American or Japanese fleets, that would be on a much more open ocean environment, um, not the confined areas of the North Sea. And that meant that the aforementioned issues with the fact that the fleets could go anywhere kind of uh, came back to haunt them and they just weren't practical at all. Um, their accident rate, obviously, as we said before, was was terrible as well. The direct consequences of the K-class at the time were actually hilariously, obviously we didn't try hard enough, so you got the M-classes where they tried to rectify the uh, short-range issue of torpedoes with sticking and sucking great 12-inch guns on the things, um, but very quickly everybody came to a sort of a mutual understanding that fleet submarines just really weren't a thing, and it all kind of died away. Earl Conley asks, did any battleship get nuclear power for their engines? So the answer to that, unfortunately, is no. By the time the last battleships were being built, mankind's sum total knowledge of how to harness nuclear power involved Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and stuffing one of those things in the engine room of a battleship probably is not going to go very well. Um, the closest you can get to a nuclear-powered battleship is probably the Kirov class of the USSR and now the Russian Federation. Cody85 asks, if the Royal Navy had built the G3 and N3 ships, how would this have affected naval design for other navies? Could we have seen improved South Dakota 1920s with 18-inch guns firing super-heavy shells? Super-heavy shells, no, mainly because those were developed in the late 1930s, so about two decades down the line for this kind of scenario. In order not to provoke a major war for the, and these ships to have been built, you would have needed a Washington Naval Treaty that was a lot more generous than the one that was actually put in place. Maybe something that said, okay, everyone can build the ships they've got on the stocks up to a certain number or something like that. Because um, G3s were on the stocks technically. I think the N3s had been ordered but not laid down. So immediate effects would have been basically just everyone would have built whatever they had on the, on the books to build themselves. So the, the Karga, Tosa, etc. in Japan, the South Dakotas would have obviously gone for 12, 16 inch instead of 9, 18 inch, um, and the Lexingtons for whatever value they would have been. The more interesting effect would have been at the other end of the naval treaties because at that point something like the Yamato wouldn't have been seen as kind of this monstrous leap in design that was required that required all this secrecy to make sure that no one matched it would have just been seen as the next logical step in battleship construction so everyone would have been looking to the end of the treaty period to build Yamato class or their equivalent thereof or possibly even more and the Japanese um probably still having their desire to one-up everybody else uh, because of their lesser numbers probably would have just skipped straight to the A150s or something like that um, so yeah, you wouldn't have seen King George V's North Carolina, South Dakota's, Iowa's, they would have been considered, uh, bait and food <laughs> for uh, the ships at the time. You would have been seeing sort of Montana, Yamato at the least, and even bigger designs. I hate to think what those would have been like. Nyanimous asks, uh, why are naval guns called rifles? Basically because, uh, smoothbore naval guns... They went out of fashion at some point in the middle of the Victorian period um, because they are not accurate at all beyond uh, fairly short range. So rifled guns were brought in to allow the shells to spin in flight, which obviously then makes them more accurate so they can hit at longer distances reliably. And as with so many things, having a rifled barrel just leads to the things being called rifles. I mean, bear in mind today, the start, the weapons that infantry carry into battle originate all the way back with the rifled musket that was then shortened to rifle. Um, technically speaking, if you track the entomology back, um, everyone is wielding assault-rifled muskets. Um, yeah, go figure. Brian Sisko asks, what is the material bundled and wrapped around the Akagi's Island seen in so many photos? So this all has its origins in how the Akagi was built. It was built as a carrier without an island, uh, much like HMS Furious was, and then 
afterwards they realised that an island might be a good idea, but obviously you can't put an awful lot of top weight on a ship that you've already balanced. So the ship's island was effectively a tin shack in terms of resistance to incoming fire. So in an attempt to ensure that the important people like the Admiral and the bridge crew actually lived past uh, five minutes after the engagement started, the Japanese came up with the idea of taking uh, the mattresses that the crew slept on, and because you're not going to be sleeping in action, they bundled them up and lashed them all around the island in, as a way of hopefully stopping sort of shrapnel and bullets and all that kind of lighter stuff, and maybe damping out shockwaves from explosions. So yeah, what you're actually looking at is uh, half the crew's sleeping supplies uh, wrapped around the island in an attempt to literally cushion the interior. One of our originals, SSE Weston, says, um, After looking back on your Agincourt special, I was reminded of the old Brazilian battleship Sao Paulo. If you're familiar with that ship's last voyage, what do you think happened to her and the 14 men who were aboard? So, for those of you not in the know, the Sao Paulo was one of the two Minas Gerais battleships of the Brazilian Navy, and please let me know if I pronounce that anywhere close to correctly. And what happened to her was that when she was de eventually decommissioned, she was sold for scrap, and in the early 1950s, she was taken under tow by two tugs to be towed away to the scrapyard. Coming into the vicinity of the Azores in the Atlantic, the two tugs and the ship ran into heavy storms. The wind and the weather was too much for the tugs. Uh, they were almost smashed together, and one of them cut its line to let the stronger tug manage without being smashed into by the other tug. Um, and then the, the force of the wind and weather tore that cable apart as well. So the ship, the Sao Paulo, was left adrift. The tugs tried to get back as soon as possible, but they couldn't find it, and the ship just seemingly disappeared. Theories have ranged over the years of what happened, everything from being sunk as an insurance scam, because supposedly it was complete, still completely watertight, um, to being uh, resold under another name, although I think someone would be suspicious of a random dreadnought battleship showing up, um, all the way along to the standard people who think the thing was kidnapped by aliens and taken off to Venus or something like that. Having done a little digging myself, um, I discovered that there are conflicting accounts of exactly how watertight it was. Um, some eyewitnesses who were on the ship just before it left port testified that whilst all the various holes and casements and portholes and everything had been plugged, the job hadn't been done properly. Um, whilst the surveyor, whose job it was to inspect all of that, insisted that yes, it had been done properly. So, conflicting evidence there. But simply put, the ship had no functioning engines. It was very light because loads of uh, valuable and important stuff had been stripped out already. It was basically just a hulk of scrap metal at this point. So it was floating much higher than it normally would have done. And it was in the middle of a major storm and a ship that cannot steer, cannot propel itself and is sitting unusually high and therefore unstably in the water. If it's left adrift in a major storm, doesn't have a very long life expectancy. I mean, even assuming that all the portholes and skylights and such had been properly shut, in the face of a storm like the one it ran into, a lot of those temporary fixtures and fittings could have been washed away. And without any means of correcting its own course, once those cables parted, the ship would have been very quickly blown broadside onto the waves, at which point the waves would have crashed over it, brought on board water, caused it to list, and eventually the waves would have flipped it over and it would have capsized. Um, it's telling that the testimony directly from the tugs themselves talks about the fact that the wind and weather had gotten up so much that the ship was actually already being forced broadside onto the waves before the second tow rope went, despite the best efforts of the second tug. So that points to me uh, towards the idea that probably very shortly after the ropes were um, cut that it probably got hit by a large wave or multiple large waves which tore open some of the temporary seals on various bits and pieces which then admitted large amounts of water which would have given the ship a list and then the next big wave that came along probably just flipped the thing upside down and it would have been gone in minutes. Uh, taking with it the unfortunate people who were on board. And 
Thel Vadami asks, did warships have blowout panels on their magazines to limit damage and casualties like modern tanks? Ironically, this was actually the subject of a chat on the Discord server during this past week. Join it if you want to uh, have a chat. So the answer to that is no, and the reasons are as follows. Basically, with a tank, especially the Abrams, which is known for having its blowout panels, the ammunition is stored basically right next to the outer edge of the hull. So if there is an explosion, these blowout panels allow the explosion to be vented directly out into the open air. And obviously, uh, overpressure follows the path of least resistance, so it kind of likes to go that way. Um, and therefore, the interior of the tank is mostly saved. Unfortunately, when you're talking about a ship, people tend not to want the magazines to explode in the first place. I mean, similar to a tank, really. Um, but because a ship is so large, they have the opportunity of burying and armouring the magazines as deep in the ship as they possibly can, uh, which means that there isn't anywhere close to the outside of the hull where the magazine could vent to. So if you consider the magazine, you have a effectively a cylinder and where can you where can you um, vent an explosion that's going on? If you vent it anywhere horizontally, well, as I said, you're deep in the heart of the ship, so that's kind of what you're trying to prevent, because otherwise you're just going to completely gut the inside of your ship and probably blow yourself in half. If you vent downwards, you're going to blast a socking great hole in the underside of your ship, which, again, is not usually held to be a good thing for long-term survival. So the only other way that you could go would be up. And again, unfortunately for this kind of idea, up is also blocked because as we've mentioned with things like Jutland, where the shell protection, uh, flash protection, sorry, was removed, flash and fire and explosion traveling down from the turret was known as a major hazard. So they put all sorts of fancy safety interlocks and uh, valves and doors precisely to prevent the spread of an explosion from the turret down to the magazine. And this works equally well in reverse. So this very systems that prevent you from exploding from hits topside mean that if you do take a magazine hit, your magazine explosion isn't really going to be able to vent quickly and therefore safely out uh, via the top of the magazine. And then, of course, you have the turret itself above that, which is going to weigh a couple of thousand tons, maybe, if uh, the maximum, and so that's going to contain the explosion, even if it bursts its way through all the flash protection. So this basically means that when a magazine goes off, it's just going to blow the ship to pieces. Um, the path upwards is the path of least resistance purely because uh, the flash doors and everything are a bit weaker than the thick armoured cylinder um, that the magazine armour tends to be made of. The fundamental problem is that even if you created some kind of butterfly valve type system that blocked flash from going down but didn't impede it going back up and maybe built some blowout panels into the roof of the turret, well apart from the fact you'd be very unpopular with the turret crew, um, the fact of the matter is with the kind of explosive payload that's in a battleship's magazines, you would be looking at assuming that everything else held and all the explosion vented out the top, you'd effectively be looking at a short-lived, extremely high-power rocket motor powered by several hundred tons of explosive, and every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So you'd have an awful lot of force pushing down, which would probably snap the ship's keel, which is not really going to help your overall survival situation. Um, so yeah, that's why they didn't go for them. And last question, again, running this episode a bit longer because of the 5k subscriber competition bit at the front. Uh, Lady Ponfar asks, why didn't the Axis powers disable the Panama Canal? Well, they dearly would have liked to, um, trust me, but the thing is with canals, especially ones the size of the Panama Canal, the gates and locks have to be pretty strong in the first place because they have to stand up to the weight of all the water that's on the other side. Um, so 
it's not the kind of thing you can just sort of maybe lob a few grenades out or machine gun and make it break. You have to throw some serious explosive at it. Um, I mean, when the RF were trying to to break the German dams or the Mona, Ida, and Sorp dams, uh, they had to use sort of about five ton bouncing bombs. And you're not really getting a strategic bomber from Germany or Japan to Panama anytime soon. About the best chance they would have had would have been to maybe sneak a U-boat in there and torpedo the gates. But one, torpedoing the gates, yes, it would temporarily inconvenience it, but gates can be replaced. Damaging the rest of it would require a lot more um time so you probably have to shell the mechanisms and maybe send men ashore to sabotage certain things and again the americans weren't stupid they had men there they had coastal defenses they had ships looking for exactly this kind of thing um and the germans realizing that it was basically a one in a million shot decided there were better things for their u-boats to be doing i don't know if the japanese ever even thought about it to be honest and so we come to the end of another episode of the dry dock uh thank you all very much for listening and thank you all very much for watching i'll see you again during the week with the weekly special video and for those of you who are on the discord server i will see you on there okay then bye bye